um, internet was happening and I need to be part of it. And it's, it's something similar to what's going on with crypto and blockchain today. And in the process of doing so, I've tried investment banking, tried um, startups in the internet space twice, and realized that I am I'm not a good founder. It is very difficult to be a good founder. And I don't, I don't have the uh, uh, sort of uh, attention to details and the tenacity to just do one thing extremely well. Um, and I realized that uh, I'm good at figuring things out, how things are coming in work. ways, um, what's coming up, what's around the corner. And I have a feel for consumer and understand what consumers want, um, region after region or country after country. So that's how I decided that being a VC was, uh, was something that I'm probably better at and start applying myself. And if you ask me how I pick unicorns, um, if you care about the founder, you care about what they're doing, and you love the industry or sector they're in, you develop uh, some kind of intuition over a period of time, and you look for patterns. And over time, uh, as student in history, I love studying uh, history of rise and fall of nations, also rise and fall of sports teams. And you do that enough, you develop a sense of what could be big, and be willing to jump in early with the founders to scale the company. So I live in Hong Kong, but I'm originally from Canada, so I also am East and West. And I work for a lot of startups in China, a lot of startups in the US. So what is the difference between a startup in China, a startup founder in China, and a startup founder here in the US? Uh, US is very big, obviously. So I'll, I'll center the discussion mostly around uh, something about it. I think, um, as someone who kind of grew up in Silicon Valley, it's easy to see how it is a, the center of innovation in the world for a long time. Um, Stanford, Berkeley, amazing institutions, a lot of funding from US military, open environment, uh, very easy to transfer technology out of university into a commercial world. Having said that, uh, when I first went to China in 95, I thought it would take a long time for China to modernize. But over the next 20 years, it's impressive to what, see what founders in that country have done. And GD Group was very early uh, in Alibaba, as early as 2003. And valuation back then was a very expensive $180 million, obviously very different today. And so we see how the nation changed, even though it's a communist regime, the founders um, thrived despite it, and not, not in spite of it. Uh, not because of it, but in, uh, in spite of it. And it's, it's, we have a podcast on Nine Six, as you mentioned. It's nine a.m. to nine p.m. Uh, six days a week. Actually, that's wait nine. a minute. Wait a minute. Let's make sure everyone heard that. Nine a.m. Nine a.m. to nine p.m. Nine p.m. Six days a week. Six days a week. Okay, that's what a startup founder does in China. In China, in China. Okay. Something a little bit. Um, <laughs> they, when I invest in Xiaomi, it's pretty much double seven um, all the time, except when we want to change in and, and uh, take a quick nap. Um, they did that for the first three years. I'm not um, glorifying it. I'm not saying that that's the right way to do it. Um, some people even argue, hey, if you're so uh, hardworking, maybe you're not very efficient at what you do. That's a, that's a common phrase. And you work smart or work hard. You can't have both. Um, but yes, we, we do see time and time again, there are quite a number of founders in China um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, were able to keep that up and um, be able to be quite efficient at what they do. Some are arguing, oh, they just copy. It's much easier to copy. Sure, there's definitely examples of that. At least for, for the first 10 years in China, you see that between 1995 to 2005. But what has happened in the last in this decade, starting with WeChat uh, in China and then the, the bike sharing uh, companies, that you do see that uh, their companies are innovating and come with product that the West hasn't seen. And you see Facebook Messenger try to copy. WeChat, uh, Instagram, and uh, Snapchat all doing something similar. And, and, and now you're going to see more and more cross-border exchanges between the two countries. All right, let's talk a little bit about WeChat, because this is something that I've noticed. I'm explaining WeChat to a lot of American and European startups. So what I see uh, with WeChat is that everybody knows it's probably it's a messaging platform, but it's much more than that. Because the Chinese community, the Chinese culture, needs more than just that. What else does it do, and why do you think um, American, you know, American startups are not like making WhatsApp and things do the same thing? Um, I think in Silicon Valley, it's always the philosophy of be focused on what you do. So there's an inherent uh, interest on the supply side to come with apps that are single purpose and do it extremely well um, and have good unit economics. If needed, it could be very high end, 
and will gradually come down to the mass market over time, but you will have be, uh, be able to establish a brand, the physicians, the way you do it. And that's something that's ingrained and developed has worked well for Silicon Valley over the last 30 years. What China has discovered is that it's because it's so hard to monetize in China initially in e-commerce space and in gaming space and in uh, uh, internet service space, as revenue is so small, that you can't just be doing one thing and get rewarded for it. So they have figured a way to satisfy a lot of needs from the user and hope that for all that, some of them could be value added and charge premium. But for the most part, you won't get as many people using the app as possible. To do that, you gotta fulfill more functions. Hence, you have more than that SX, you gotta do more. You can't just do one single purpose app. You gotta do a super app that has many functions in it. Whether it's like something like WeChat, that's more than the messenger, um, or something like a uh, Make 20 uh, that allows you to book a variety of things, not just uh, rice sharing and, uh, and the food delivery, but also travel and, and other things. That over time, um, people get used to and they get spoiled by them. So now, as you know, from traveling to China, you don't need car cash anymore. You can use Alipay or WeChat Pay. Even an offline store will accept that. Um, and you can order food anytime you want, and it's delivered within 30 minutes. Um, anytime? Anytime. Meaning anytime. anytime. Not till like midnight. Like Even after time. midnight, you can still get food. And when you say payment, you don't just mean I can pay a 7-Eleven. I can pay a street vendor yes. who's making noodles. Even beggar. Even like, beggars. We have paid. Even a QR code. Wow, wow. Just scan it and pay the money. So it's so efficient. That, um, that it can just get, get, get. It is, it is amazing what that has done in the last uh, four years. And it's no wonder, uh, you know, in China right now, mobile payment is about 11x the market size it is in the U.S. Why is that? Well, partially because the U.S. credit cards are so popular. So the marginal utility from switching to, from a credit card to Apple Pay is less. I go to a restaurant, I want to pay with Apple Pay, I can't. I go back to my home and get my credit card because I left my wallet at home. Whereas in China, uh, this credit card is, wasn't as unpopular. It's more expensive to maintain terminals and also char be charged by uh, the equivalent of Visa in China, China Unit Pay, that uh, mobile payment took off. It's cheaper, faster, more efficient. So that's another good thing to touch upon. So because credit cards were not a major thing in China, they had to jump over that and create this digital wallet, right? Whereas in the US and Europe, credit cards are a main thing. They have a lot to lose. Visa, MasterCard are not going to jump across this whole thing. They need to keep it. Plus, users are like that, right? So what else in China have you seen like that, that has jumped over these things that are common to us in the, in the West? Um, last year in 2008, in May, um, Dara from Uber, spoke at the uh, uh, RICO conference that hosts annual league in Southern California. And uh, what he said is that um, Uber is evolving. You will be an app for all kinds of transportational needs, which also includes travel. And what he's essentially saying, without saying it explicitly, is that Uber is going to look like May 20 in China. Um, you can book, uh, book uh, car rides, you can book uh, bike share, you can order food. You can travel, you can look up reviews on restaurants, uh, you can get uh, uh, discounts at Groupon Dust. So there's a variety of things all combined into one. And over time, you can see Uber and Uber Eats um, will end up being like that. It's been, and Uber Eats going faster than Uber Rice. If Uber stayed at like Lyft, just in rice sharing, growth will eventually slow down, and that's you go global. So that's another interesting point, which is that it used to be going global is one single purpose app. Keep it simple, do it globally and get massive scale um, from doing one thing well. Over time, you can see that it will be more of a super app of different sizes, depending on the situation, and go global uh, later, but start off with regional domination first. And this is the lesson we see from the US versus China, is that the rest of the world, whether it's Latin America, Southeast Asia, India, Africa, Middle East, are increasingly look at both models and learning from the Chinese model even more than before. And we host a lot of people coming to our Silicon Valley office, as well as in Beijing and Shanghai. And it's impressive that the team goes to both places, not just one anymore. Um, does everybody know what Meituan is? No, okay, let's talk a little bit of <laughs> yeah, either. Let's talk a little bit about that. And uh, what, what, is, what is it? Why is it so huge? Why is it worth so much money now? Right, you, you turn on <laughs> Meituan, it's very busy. It seems like it's a combination of Yelp, Groupon, Uber Eats, Uber, Expedia, all combined to one. And so they're taking on uh, five verticals at the same time. Um, and uh, this, uh, it's a public traded company on Compton Stock Exchange, market caps about 35 billion. Um, and why, why, why is that interesting? Because that's all in China. And Uber may go public this year at about 
are a hundred billion dollar valuation. That's worldwide uh, with a stake in DD in China. So the whole world is a hundred billion, and this company alone with competitor in China is 35 billion. Not just how massive that China market is at the surface, but you dig deeper, it's because there are so many products that work off each other. I'll give you one example. If just Uber or Uber Eats um, is less interesting, what Mayfunk has done is that because they have relationship with a lot of merchants. So Casey, you're going home, you order a car ride from Mayfunk. So Mayfunk knows your route. Once it doesn't know it's route, it will prompt um, looking at the restaurants along your route and know which one has a promotion that's already in place in the database. And it will prompt you to give you a choice when you will order it or not. So you can order it, either go there and pick up in person, or you would go home and a food will arrive you know, 15 minutes later. So you can have it. So it's extremely efficient. And so instead of the, um, the, the merchant will even pay you to you know, stop by his, his restaurant if you want to. It's subsidized part of the right. And this is doing that because instead of paying China's Google, Baidu, for search um, listing, might as well be very intentional driven and just pay uh, big twine because he knows you're going back to his, to his restaurant. So it's things like that that makes it interesting when you have multiple businesses that can work well in sync with each other. You would just have one, on one, one app or one purpose, it's hard to make that work. So I was just in Zhenzhen recently, and I went with my friend to KFC, and they paid for a chicken meal with their face. Okay? <laughs> so this is uh, something that, to me, is amazing, yeah. right? It's scary, but amazing. Scary. scary and amazing. So from your perspective, since you also spend time in the U.S., I think that's a huge privacy breach. I'm not sure if everybody in this room is willing to give out their face to pay for Correct. chicken. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But to talk a little bit about the Chinese consumer and the American consumer and how, you know, what we see in China, that they don't really are so hung up on their privacy to make it easier for them to do things like get food on the way home and, and give up their data so that they can get a better experience digitally. Right, I'll give you another, another example. Not seems good or bad, but it is what it is. Um, we moved from Shanghai to uh, Beijing 2011. We have since moved back to the Bay Area in 2014. But when we moved to Beijing, our second baby was uh, was born. And uh, we got this email uh, about three months into it, uh, after he was born, uh, from uh, Taoba of Alibaba. And it says uh, to my wife, thank you, Claire, for being a great supporter of, of, of Taobao. Uh, we were with you with your first child. And it showed so, so much of her, something about she bought. And then, uh, you know, congratulations on your second child. So I was both my wife and I look at this message. It's interesting, kind of scary, but at the same time, it's also impressive that the data mining is working and it actually can, can see what's going on. So um, and you're right, most Chinese consumers are used to, um, uh, I don't think they've ever read 1984, but they're used to, they're used to having a book, I think. <laughs> they're used to have, you know, have everything more served uh, with data mining. And what it means is that uh, this model probably would be adopted uh, organically by other uh, emerging markets where consumers don't mind this kind of uh, uh, lack of restrictions. Uh, for better or for worse, it is an alternative model to what Silicon Valley has done, and it's, um, and it's increasing cost of friction. And the US government is paying a lot more attention than to what the Chinese startups are doing than ever before. And I think we're in a period you're going to see a lot more volatility um, uh, over the next 10 years. One of the things I, I, I recently learned about is this company in China called Luckin Coffee. Right, let's talk a little bit about that. So um, people see it, a face value looks like a competitor to Starbucks, but it's not, right? They're doing something about data mining, selling, using coffee as a lure to get users to use it. Well, what, um, there are examples like that and more, which um, uh, Chinese startups are very good at figuring out do one thing to get you in and upsell you with other services. And they all try to come up with more um, experience and services that you're not expecting. Another example is KFC. I go into KFC in the morning and I can get a Chinese breakfast uh, made. And it's hot and it's warm. And uh, in the US, clean. and it's clean, and it's, safe. it's clean. And so it, it is uh, impressive. And uh, for, for KFC, China's probably their number one market. So increasingly multinationals, who are willing to localize um, and do something different for Chinese market, we see interesting results. I just uh, stopped by Airbnb China office. I helped them with their China entry strategy over the last four years. And it's impressive to see how much they have grown in China over the last 12 months. 
and now they have a, a China GM, uh, head of China in place that was a founder before, not just someone who from a, a executive from a tech company. So you're, now you're seeing more and more founders willing to consider alternative path um, in, in doing things beyond just focus on China. Okay, that's a great point. I want to talk about Airbnb for a second. So at the Rise Conference, because it's an international uh, event, a lot of people are coming in to Hong Kong to see how they can get into China. Right? And I think that, you know, people say get a local partner, but Airbnb doesn't have a local partner. They went in directly themselves. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like maybe some of these startups here that are looking to get in China, what's the best way to get into? Sure, uh, it's a good question. Uh, typically, we encourage startup to look for a partner in China, whether it's the investors or someone like yourself who are familiar with the Chinese market. Um, I think for Airbnb, they thought about getting a partner in China but they couldn't come to the road, they just couldn't always find the right fit. So they decided to go on their own. It took them more time. But over time, they found the right team with the right help from investors and end up getting the right license from Chinese government in order to operate independently. So it took a lot more work, but I think it's paying off for them. <laughs> um, the easiest path is to buy Yahoo here and just invest in Alibaba and just grow with Alibaba, which is what Uber eventually did with Didi. And I think that's, I still think that's the best route, uh, but it'll take a lot more work when doing it. All right, they're, they're asking us to hurry up here. I have so many questions. I, I have, we have to we have sit down and do a podcast together. But um, because I'm Canadian, I want to get your take on Huawei. What is going on? What do you think is going on with Huawei? How, how safe are the people in the room with uh, Huawei technology? Um, are Canadians going to be allowed to go back to Canada soon, uh, to China soon? My, 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 my wife's Canadian. Okay. And so uh, I still feel that it's like probably the safest in the next 10 years to carry a Canadian passport or a Singaporean passport. Um, so you're a lot more neutral. Um, I, you know, I think the tension between U.S. and uh, China over tech is increasing. Because from U.S. government perspective, um, it doesn't distinguish startups with VC funding with um, uh, Chinese SMEs anymore. It feels that over time that uh, uh, the, the, it will be harder for tech companies in China to stay truly independent. Uh, of course, from China's perspective, it feels that all the spying uh, goes on uh, with the US government and Google and iPhone anyway. So they're not doing anything different. But increasingly, it's become just becoming a lot more, they're running each other a lot more. So I think that, uh, unfortunately, over the next 10 years, it's we're going to see more of volatility. So being uh, in places that are more neutral will end up being sort of what people try to go for. And, what, and how do you think uh, the China-US trade war is going to affect startups in the short term? I think the trade war affects the startups less directly. The tariffs don't affect the companies, as many companies, that much. However, it does affect people's confidence uh, for the future. We do see manufacturers in, Ch in China investing less, waiting to see what is going to happen. Um, personally, I feel that the trade war is part of the bigger issue. So the, there will be some kind of agreement on trade for now. But over time, how uh, the Chinese com tech companies behave, um, how CCP behaves about uh, global expansion will say a lot about what will happen over our relationship between the two countries. All right, uh, that's all the time we have. Um, I encourage you to subscribe to the 996 podcast to learn more about China and what's going on there. Um, but please, give a warm thank you to Hans Tom.